to spend money! Is what I'd say if I was some sort of weirdo whose favorite part of capitalism was multi-millionaires hoarding their wealth. However, discussions around creating a competitive and balanced league, despite disparities in teams' payroll, has been around as long as PED usage, with them ramping up in the wake of Steve Cohen reaching new heights in how much you can spend on 40 guys in uniform, with a staggering $319 million. As of writing this, the gap between them and the second highest team is greater than the gap between the second and sixth. I'm not going to sit here and argue if team spending money on players is good for the game. It is. But there is a very real financial disparity that separates teams like the New York Yankees from the Kansas City Royals. The reason Steve Cohen can spend stupid amounts of money on the Mets is because he has a lot of it. In contrast, owner of the Reds, Mr. Sell the Team Bob Castellini, has a public net worth of $400 million, while Uncle Insider Steve has a public net worth of $17.4 billion. With a B. But does spending actually lead to team success? One of the many beauties of baseball is that it's kind of a dumb sport that features plays like this and this and let's not forget this. You throw enough of those plays over 162 games in addition to a three to four round tournament and you're bound to get a few Cinderella stories of bottom 10 payroll teams going up and defeating $100 million squads. So I want to figure out to what extent spending translates to on-field success. Should you give up on your favorite team because they're too afraid to throw stupid money on elite slash overvalued talent, and are teams buying championships something to actually worry about? So I have derived a formula that I believe will answer that question. So essentially for each year from 2000 to 2022, I sorted teams in order of their payroll and mapped them out to this figure. The top payroll gets a value of 15, and with each subsequent payroll rank, that value goes down by 1 until we reach negative 15 for the lowest payroll, skipping 0. Then I attach a multiplier to each team. If the team doesn't reach the playoffs that year, they get a value of 0, because they don't matter. I don't care if they won 88 games or 67, they're nothing to me. If the team gets a wild card without advancing past the division round, they get a value of 1. Win the division without any other advancement, 1.2. If they get eliminated in the championship series, they get a value of 1.4. If they win a pennant, aka they get beat in the World Series, we give them a value of 1.6. And finally, the World Series winner gets a multiplier of 2. Hallelujah. I figured I'd give the World Series winner an extra tick because, you know, that's what the goal is. Anyway, we add the values for every team up, which gives us our final value. And we're going to average the value of each year to get our final score. So what does this number tell us? Well, after running a few example calculations and much deliberation, I started to see some lines being drawn. A value in the 0 to 15 range means that spending money is actively hurting your team's chance of winning. Now, let me let you in on a little secret. We're not going to arrive at this value in the end. MLB teams are run by very intelligent people. And I don't know if you've heard, but they do spend money. Most of them. The title of this video is Does Spending Matter? When really it should be titled Does Spending Matter That Much? But I figured you wouldn't click on that word vomit of a caption. And honestly, I'm glad that you're here. We intuitively know that spending matters though. The point of this video is to determine how much it actually does matter. 15 to 30 is where it gets more interesting because we can safely conclude that spending money doesn't really help your team succeed any more than teams who don't. Not that spending makes your team worse, but it's not making it much better than we thought. 30 to 45 is results inconclusive. I kind of hope we don't land here, but at the same time, wouldn't that be the most typical conclusion for the game of baseball? Putting in hours of effort, analyzing, and number crunching, just to go, eh. 45 to 60 is yes, Spending money is necessary and does heavily correlate to team success. And above 60 basically means that your team should be waving the white flag if they're in the bottom 15 of payroll. Think of this formula as a seesaw, with each side being occupied by the bottom 15 and top 15 payrolls respectively. Which side will carry more weight? I don't know about you, but I think it'll be the side with more money. But we'll see. Let's address the several elephants in the room. Is this an overly simplified calculation for a question that requires at least a master's in statistics and data analytics to properly answer? Yes. Do I care? I mean, a little, but hey, for the resources I have, 
I feel like this is a quick and dirty method that you can use to win an argument at a bar, but probably shouldn't cite anywhere you want to be taken seriously. I'm basically taking a problem that requires a complex machine to solve and trying to stuff it into a lawnmower engine. So just a few issues I'll bring up before you start writing your thesis rebuttal in the comments. One. This doesn't weigh just how much each team actually spent, which is the crux of the issue with Steve Cohen's Mets. On paper, they have the biggest payroll. Yeah, a bunch of teams have had the biggest payroll in years past, but that doesn't show just how massive it is compared to the rest of the league. Two, the values I assigned are super arbitrary. Maybe I should factor in every team even if they didn't make the playoffs. Maybe the wild card should weigh less if they don't make it past the division round. Maybe the World Series winner should weigh more. Maybe I should just stop making YouTube videos and return to my job at the Wendy's. I hope that the sample size will smoothen out some of these issues. And please, I am open to criticism, but just know that 95% of what you are possibly thinking to tear this apart has probably already run through my head. I know it's a simple formula, but I like it because I'm a simple kind of man. And I gotta use a formula that I can love and understand. Also, before I go on, I'm not factoring in 2020. It's such a goose egg of a year, and from what I understand, most evaluators have thrown 2020 results out the window. Trevor, it's consensual if I'm enjoying it, Bauer won a Cy Young that year as the Marlins made the playoffs without an improbable World Series run. Enough said. So with all that out of the way, I have to go and run these calculations. Um, I guess I'll just throw on one of my old videos while you wait. After talking yourself down that proverbial cliff, you check out Albert Bell, who was able to put together yet another monster season to lead his team to a first place finish. You're still trying to live down last year when he voted Mo Vaughn over him, despite the fact that Bell literally surpassed him in every consequential stat besides stolen bases. But Albert Bell has repeatedly insulted you, your peers, and your mom. I'm done. What? Yeah, I was able to throw the data in an Excel sheet and run it pretty quickly. Well, don't you want to hear about how Juan Gonzalez didn't deserve either of his two MVP awards using a stat that everyone has opinions on? I mean, yeah, it sounds cool, but I could just watch the actual video. We're doing something kind of different here. Oh yeah, that's right. Well, I guess I'll be going back then. You're so understanding past no more fielders. You two no more fielders. So with the calculations complete, let's sit back, put on some jazz, and talk through these results. Welp, huge start for the inconclusive heads out there. That's what happens when the team with the highest payroll wins the World Series, the same year two bottom five payrolls win their division. This is the epitome of return on investment. We have the Arizona Diamondbacks, who entered the league, as all expansion teams do, with a bottom 10 payroll before sneaking their way into the top 10 by piling a dump truck full of money on two elite starters. What's crazy to me is just how old their team was. They came in that year with the oldest lineup and the third oldest pitching staff. Maybe they can be an example for Mets fans to point to in 2023, whose rotation is closer to annual prostate exams than the drinking age. It's also worth noting that the Cleveland ball team won their division with the top five payroll, marking the only time this century they were a part of that group. Again, maybe an argument of how smaller market teams can spend a little bit of money when they see a strong opportunity to do so? Maybe? Ha, ah, our first year of the low payroll. The Disney-led Anaheim Angels won the World Series with the, by definition, most modest payroll that year. 2002 would be their last World Series appearance to date, even though the following year would be the last time they wouldn't rank in the top 10 highest payrolls due to an already induced identity crisis while burning money like it was the Great Depression. I know you've already seen it, but And That's Baseball's video is the perfect breakdown for how not to invest in your team's payroll. Please check it out if you haven't. Didn't take too long for us to see a bottom 10 payroll win the World Series, huh? This is a rare occurrence. Again, we already sort of instinctually know that winning with a bottom tier payroll is not likely and certainly not sustainable. But this year shows us that it's possible to win the World Series on a penny's budget. Wow. So the Red Sox broke the curse of the Bambino while also breaking the bank. This may be a huge outlier year, as all top three payroll teams made the postseason, while the 19th ranked Twins were the only bottom 15 payroll team to make it, in their quest to never win a playoff game for the next 20 years. Oh, <laughs> 
<laughs> well, this may get out of hand fast. This time, the lowest payroll to make the postseason were the 16th highest Padres, who won the NL West over the Dodgers that year, which honestly is something I forgot was possible. Now, the White Sox did win the World Series on a modest budget, but three of the five top payrolls made it to the postseason that year. So, yeah. Ho. Oh. A breath of fresh air. Thank you, Cardinals, who have somehow evaded the cheap tag despite always running diabolically moderate payrolls year in and year out. We're also starting to see a decline in top 10 payrolls making the postseason. 2004, we saw 60% make it, 50% in 2005, and now just 30% in 2006. 2007 is starting to be looked at as the last good year in American culture and politics before the 2008 financial crisis, and maybe in some ways, we should have looked to MLB for signs of a bubble. This year saw three bottom 10 payroll teams make the postseason, compared to four in the top 10. Also, remember when the Cleveland Ball Club on a shoestring budget eliminated the Big Bad Yanks? Such different times back then. This is such an odd year for this exercise. First, you see the number, firmly enough in the spending is winning camp, but then you break it down and it's just, well, listen to this. No top three teams made it to the postseason this year. First time that has happened in this exercise. Seriously, up until this point, your team had a roughly two and three chance to make it to the postseason just by virtue of having a large budget. Despite that, half of the top 10 payrolls made the postseason, but it gets even weirder. None of them happened to be the World Series winner. That would be the Phillies with a 12th ranked payroll who beat the 29th ranked Rays to wear the crown that year. Just absurd all around. I mean, yeah, this shouldn't be surprising. Yankees winning it automatically throws 30 points on the board and having the perpetually playoff inept twins as the only bottom 10 team to make it that year doesn't really help the poor team cause, now does it? This is the first year of what I like to call the Rays effect. I know the Athletics get credited as the Moneyball team, but the Rays were the first to show demonstrable success on some absolutely minuscule budgets by taking the ace philosophy to team building and cranking it up to 100. The Rays won the division away from the Yankees with the 21st highest payroll, but it was the team who eliminated them and the Yankees the 27th highest Rangers who's really doing the heavy lifting for the little guy, employing two all-stars for under a mil while getting a generational year by Josh Hamilton in his R1 season. So Rangers players were getting huge raises while they decided to splurge in free agency. So now we're starting to see rise of the mid-tier payroll teams. The Cardinals, who as stated refused to jump into the top 10, won the World Series that year while beating the slightly more expensive Rangers. Noticing a trend here? The Giants seem to reinvent their team every two years on their way to a title. What makes dipping in a cheapskate territory even more remarkable is that their two highest players were the ghost of Barry Zito and Tim Lincecum, who basically contributed nothing to the team that year, meaning they theoretically could have had a bottom five budget and still won the World Series. Again, factors the formula won't consider, but interesting to think about nonetheless. Okay, the Rays effect is getting ridiculous now. The Red Sox won with a scrappy group of misfits, which for them means they were only the fourth highest payroll as opposed to their patented second. You would think a year in which a top five payroll team won it all would render a higher score, but that's what happens when five teams in the bottom 12 make the postseason. Yeah, we all knew this wasn't going to last forever. This is where I also noticed that bottom payroll teams are making the playoffs, but not really doing much else beyond that. The last bottom 10 payroll team to make it past the division round was the Rangers in 2010. I honestly believe it's because higher payroll teams are able to afford much needed rotation depth, while bottom payroll teams are crossing their fingers that Joe Random, fresh from AA, can secure 15 outs in the division series. Curious to see if this trend continues. Well, the Mets, who for some reason are running a bottom payroll team, proved me wrong. This year is a complete aberration, essentially the inverse of 2004. Six teams in the bottom 15 made it to the postseason, with no team in the top 10 getting past the division round. This is truly the year for the little guy. And spoiler alert, this is the best it's going to get for them. And it was nice while it lasted. Yeah, this is the period where we're going to see some huge disparities, and they aren't exactly going to favor the poor. Only one team in the bottom 15 made it to the postseason. Granted, it was the Cleveland Baseballers, who were a few Aroldis Chapman sliders away from a World Series win. But the list this year is extremely top-heavy. 
the Astros banged their way to their first World Series on a surprisingly modest budget, beating the Dodgers, who have now officially taken the role of highest yearly budget away from the suddenly luxury tax averse Yankees. Something not covered by the graphic or the formula that I want to point out though, the two to four highest payrolls are the Tigers, Rangers, and Giants respectively. Not even three years ago, these were teams that were making huge strides with only the Tigers scratching a top five payroll. But now they're just expensive and old. One of the key separators between smaller and larger markets is risk. A team with financial magnitude such as the Dodgers can afford a few bad contracts. Granted, they have become such an unwavering, analytically risk averse franchise that they just don't give out those contracts anymore. But a franchise like the Athletics can't afford bad practices lest they want to spend years or even decades at a time stuck in the mud. I actually figured this year would be another huge outlier, with the Red Sox Dombrowski their way to a title. But I forgot how far the Brewers went on a minuscule budget, in addition to the New Look Braves getting their sea legs, as well as the Athletics submitting their Moneyball 2 sequel, complete with getting owned by the Yankees. The Tampa Bay Rays, with the lowest budget, were able to snag a wildcard spot, defeating the fifth lowest A's before being run out of town by the Astros, who are quickly climbing up the budget ranks. So I know I compare them to the 2023 Mets, but the biggest comp to the 2001 Diamondbacks is another team from the NL East, the 2019 Washington Nationals, who, despite it making them a bit older and more expensive, over the course of their contention window, decided to splurge on elite top-end pitching to basically guide them through one of the more improbable World Series wins we've seen in the last 25 years. Nope. We've been in this period for a while now without me bringing it up but this year is starting to really cement the Dodgers effect. Using the ultra-efficient, high-performance analytical engine of the Rays and placing it into a $200 million chassis. Bottom payroll teams are starting to get squeezed out of the playoffs entirely, where this is the first year since 2016 that only two of them made the postseason. Also, before we get to our final season, it's worth noting that we are on the edge between the final average being inconclusive or favoring spending. Granted, the average is pretty much firm at this point, but I guess we'll see what 2022 has in store for us. The danger must be growing. Are the fires of hell glowing? Is the grizzly reaper mowing? Yes, the danger must be growing. 70% of the top 10 made it in the postseason this year. First time this happened, period. I don't even have to say in the sample size since I can safely assume it didn't happen from 1995 to 1999, the only years in the wildcard era that I didn't cover. I also understand that this should be expected due to the expanded playoffs, but what if I told you that only one of those teams didn't win their division or make it past the DS? That would conveniently be the Mets. In fact, all teams outside the top 10 payroll that made it this year got bounced either in the wildcard round or the division series. Time will only tell if this is an extreme anomaly or a beginning of a trend. And there we have it. This non-scientific, non-peer-reviewed exercise tells us that yes, spending money helps increase your team's chances of winning. Maybe not to the extent that we thought originally, but y'all, we knew this. Come on. Why'd y'all make me do it? Why are you even still watching? Well, of course, for some other charts that I made with my data. I do think that it's possible to find success without having to climb in the upper echelons of payroll. Teams like the 2002 Angels, 2008 Phillies, 2015 Royals, and even as recently as the 2021 Braves showed us. Just be careful with the sweetheart contracts you give out afterwards. But yeah, you are hamstringing yourself by not spending. Duh. And teams that do spend are just more fun to watch. Sure, there are franchises that have less financial resources than others, but only six teams in the top five of spending won the World Series, which is the same amount of teams in the 10 to 15 range who won. I know roster construction is an ever-moving puzzle, but I think it's reasonable for all 30 teams to spend at least 137 million to build a winning squad. I don't know, what do you all think? Please like, comment, subscribe, I'm, I'm trying to quit my full-time job at the end of the year, and that wouldn't be possible without viewers like you. So all the amount of support, I appreciate, and I hope to see you all next time.